If you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. For well, we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silent, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. Anticipating the end of the world is humanity's oldest pastime. And a lot of people speak of fate, as if it's fixed, a prophecy of destruction. As with all major religions, they all seem to have a version, don't they? Now, I'm not a theologian, and I don't have a lot of background with religious concepts, so feel free to fill me in on anything I missed. I'm sure there's going to be quite a bit. It's always tough, too, when you dive into topics on religion. It's pretty touchy. So, just one more time, a little disclaimer. I have no idea, man. I'm just trying to look into something interesting. Regardless of what you believe, though, these topics are always a good time. Who says looking into the end of days couldn't be fun, right? But what are we going to talk about? Well, the crux of the issue that I want to explore a little bit is whether or not world leaders, religious leaders, are intentionally trying to bring about prophecy, either out of some deluded sense of grandeur, or if it's tied to their personal occult beliefs, or perhaps it's simply as a way to bring about absolute power. There's a few things that got me thinking about this, and the first one we're going to talk about is this idea of the fourth turning. It seems to me that the fourth turning, the cyclical nature of generations, happened organically for a long time. I'm sure you know the saying, hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. And on and on we go. However, as you know, I don't believe we are entering the current fourth turning organically. It's actually everything but that. It's manufactured. I believe that if we had legit representation within our governments, if they were determined to ensure our prosperity, our rights, our freedoms, then our current civilized state could have gone on for another, I don't know, century or two before we reached some kind of cataclysmic moment. We very well could have bypassed this fourth turning. It was not written in stone. We have the tech, the resources, the stability. Well, we had the stability, and all we needed was good leadership. But alas, that's not what we got. No, we got a lot of corruption instead. So, okay, let's try to compare the global agenda to these doomsday prophecies. I do have a point, just bear with me. After all the UN documents we've gone over, their books, papers, mission statements, the speeches at Davos, all of it, I believe that in the 1970s, people in power intentionally set up an economic collapse that would occur right around this moment in time. We've talked a lot about this topic, so we're not going to get into it too much. But yes, I attribute the limits to growth, the formation of the World Economic Forum, getting off the gold standard, and moving to the petrodollar as a setup to move us into a different governmental paradigm. The reason they used to justify this is technological accelerationism. The effects of the rapid technological advancement that we've seen in recent years is too destabilizing and threatens the foundational power that society is built upon. Artificial intelligence, for example, threatens not only institutional power, but it will cause chaos economically. It will affect everything from the markets to mass unemployment. So, all in all, world leaders believe that a new economic system is a must. And it must be compatible with quote-unquote future governance systems. Albeit they are devising a system that is strictly benefiting the elite and turns the rest of humanity into a commodity, but let's not get distracted. The predicted end date of their timeline is 2050, with 2030 being a major marker for their success. The thing is, our current leaders, well, they are getting pretty old, and they have been planning this for a long time. As the grains of sand fall, their plans were falling too. Gonna have to speed things up, but their life's work is gonna come to fruition. 
So, things were not moving fast enough. Their timeline was getting a little out of whack, so to speak. They have big plans for the world, after all, and our stability was getting in the way. They decided that they would have to manufacture the conditions needed to push the public into this new system. As a result, they devised a plan, and a multi-decades-long campaign to engineer instability began, culminating in what is commonly referred to as the Great Reset. You might be asking yourself, what are the conditions needed to get the masses to accept this new paradigm, to accept abject tyranny? How could they actually manufacture consent? And especially with everything leading to their desired outcome. Well, 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 they like to talk about the poly crisis. As written on the World Economic Forum website, and I quote, The multiple challenges affecting the world simultaneously can be summed up by the word poly crisis. First coined in the 1970s, oh wow, what a coincidence. <laughs> Jeez. Anyway, they use it to describe the interplay between pandemic diseases, the wars going on in Ukraine and the Middle East, the cost of energy, the cost of living, and the climate crisis. All intentionally made worse by what most assume to be idiotic political decisions, as if everyone running the world is a moron. They aren't. If you take a look at all the actions being taken right now, they exacerbate the problems, rather than try to solve them. It's by design. And on top of that, well, it seems we're heading into world war. Oh, what to do when you have guided missiles and misguided leaders. Now the war in the Middle East, the war in Ukraine, the looming world war, is all tied into this economic transition. Again, we talk about this all the time, so we're going to skip ahead and, uh, yeah, we're just going to try to keep things weird. And we are getting to the weird stuff. We're almost there. But what if, just as with the fourth turning, the Great Reset, and the Poly Crisis, what if, with religious prophecy, they are doing the same thing, trying to manufacture conditions to get the outcome they desire? It's not very easy to reconcile these ideas either. If you have a plan for a technocratic planet, a world government system, surely bringing about the end times is not in the plan, right? You can't have complete power if there is no world to wield said power over, you know what I mean? But that's where things get pretty interesting. So, you could throw in the theories about depopulation, how they want to get the world's population down to about 500 million or a billion people. Well, world war could really make that happen. There's also a lot of rumors about what these world leaders really believe on a spiritual level. Some of these people take occultism to new heights, and we're going to get into that. But first, let's talk about prophecy. So why don't we start off with a doomsday prophet that everyone's heard of. Yes, that's right, Nostradamus. And then we'll get to an example that uh, might have some consequences for us in the near future. One of his quatrains has been interpreted as saying that a new world war would break out in 2023, and contained within the same prophecy is the cryptic line, the lights of Mars will go out. Some believe it's referring to the aspiration to take the human race interplanetary. As in March of last year, Elon Musk suggested that by 2029, we would set foot on Mars for the first time. So, maybe Nostradamus is pouring cold water on such bold aspirations with his cryptic line, the light of Mars will go out. I mean, yeah, it's part of the same quatrain that contains the prophecy of the seven-month Great War, implying that both the conflict and the dimming of humanity's Mars-focused fantasies will occur in the same calendar year. After all, you can't become a spacefaring civilization if humans nuke themselves into oblivion, right? Nostradamus aside, what about religious prophecy? So, off the top of my head, we have the Book of Revelations, the breaking of the seals, and many people point to our current time period as the quote-unquote end of days. When it comes to biblical prophecy, few phenomena have captured the imagination of believers in Christianity and Judaism as profoundly as the concept of the red heifer. A deep-seated longing for the apocalyptic events foretold in both Christianity and Judaism is central to many believers' faith. This longing becomes even more pronounced as humanity approaches significant millennial milestones in its history. For many fundamentalists, contemporary events in the Middle East are seen as the fulfillment of ancient prophecies made by prophets such as Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and John. These prophecies posit that three pivotal events must precede the return of the Messiah. The first one is the restoration of the nation of Israel, the Jewish control of Jerusalem, and the reconstruction of the temple, which was last destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. Notably, two of these conditions have already been met, and believe it or not, there are groups actively trying to attain the prophetic trifecta. And so, the Temple Institute and other organizations have been established with the goal of building the Third Temple. But some theologians believe the construction of this Third Temple is linked to Judgment Day. Uh, yeah, I think that's what they're trying to start. They want the end times. That's kind of the whole point. Anyway, as stated though, they would need to sacrifice a red heifer before constructing the Third Temple. The thing is, is that they have been trying to intentionally set the conditions to give birth to this red heifer. 
They have been importing certain breeds and trying their damnedest to make it happen. Which, in my eyes, is cheating. So, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, back in September, people believe that this prophecy has finally been realized, manufactured or not. As the first red heifer in 2000 years was born in Israel. I guess there was one born in 1996, but that one had a blemish. The prophecy says, and I quote, The cow must be red, without blemish. So yeah, the first one in 1996 was not, uh, it was a no-go. And so, they kept trying. And uh, that's the main sticking point. They are actively trying to make this happen. It's not happening naturally. The new calf has since undergone extensive examination by rabbis who confirmed she is a viable candidate for the biblical red heifer. So, okay, we have another group who believes we are in the end of days and are actively trying to make it happen. But what about the Vatican? Well, we do have the prophecy of the popes. It dates back to the 12th century with Saint Malachi. And I quote, The real Malachi was an Irish saint who lived from 1094 to 1148. His alleged prophecies, however, were not discovered until around 1590. The legend goes that Malachi experienced a vision in which he was given insight into Pope's past, present, and future, and that he recorded his vision as a series of cryptic verses. Now, as far as I can tell, some of these turned out to be correct, but let's skip ahead to the last Pope. This book begins with Celestine II and says the Catholic Church will have 112 Popes in total before the Church ends. Pope Benedict, who was the leader of the Catholic Church from 2005 to 2013, retired due to old age. That means the current Pope, Pope Francis, is lucky number 112, the last one in St. Malachi's prediction. And I quote again, In the final persecution of the Holy Roman Church, there will sit Peter the Roman, who will pasture his sheep in many tribulations. And when these things are finished, the city of seven hills will be destroyed, and the dreadful judge will judge his people. The end. Peter the Roman. Okay. Well, his name is not Peter, and he chose the papal name of Francis. But I guess you could make an argument that he is in fact Roman. His parents immigrated to Argentina from Italy, so I don't know. But this Pope Francis is really running his quote-unquote herd through tribulations, that's for sure. He's working with Rothschild on stakeholder capitalism, he's entirely involved in the Great Reset, and a lot of people are pretty mad at him for going against church doctrine with various social agendas. He really is just a puppet for the global establishment. They trot him out to talk about climate change, immigration, carbon taxes, and even to give blessings on certain wars. It's, uh... It's crazy. So could his leadership just act as a harbinger of chaos and the end of the church? Or perhaps, the end of the world? Okay, so let's get into some occult stuff. And then we'll finish up with Albert Pike and the Three World Wars. The media machine tries to dictate public discourse through manipulation. We all know this. It's done through many different methods. But one way this is accomplished is by pinning truth up against the unbelievable and using it to sway perception by forcing the choice between ridicule and acceptance. Think of it as a game, balancing their power with public perception, either real or manufactured. And if power is dependent upon belief, then truth becomes a precarious inconvenience, one that must be diluted and left to wither in the shadow of doubt. There's a lot of information left out of history. After all, it is written by the winners. Certainly, there are precarious figures that were involved in the development of the political machine that have been left to the margins, only to be discussed and read about if you dig. Well, tonight, we're going to take a look at one such political figure and a theory that if ever could be proven, would indeed become more than a mere inconvenience. But when you read about Albert Pike and the Three World Wars, you have to ask yourself, could this be real? Or is it a part of the greatest hoax of all time? So I just read a story on Zero Hedge that was passed along to me on social media. It tells the story of Leo Taxel. We must go back over 130 years to get to the bottom of this story. And it all begins in France. Leo Taxel, born in 1854. He was placed in Jesuit seminary school, where he became disillusioned with the Catholic faith and religion in general. As a result, he became a writer. He targeted Christianity with scathing critiques such as the holy pornographers, confessions and confessors, and the Pope's mistress. He even ventured into satirical pieces like the Life of Jesus, which made a mockery of the Immaculate Conception and the Amusing Bible. In 1884, he wrote The Secret Loves of Pope Pius, which is exactly what the salacious title suggests, and eventually led to accusations of libel. Now, okay, so he eventually did change pace. Taxel announced that he converted back to being a Catholic in 1885, and set to work on a new endeavor. And on top of that, he had a new target, the Freemasons. 
Over the next several years, he published a four-volume history of Freemasonry, containing curious but unsourced accounts of eyewitness participation in strange rites. The books were sensational, and Taxel even had an audience with Pope Leo himself to congratulate him on all the good work he did exposing the dastardly plans of the Freemasons. So, back in the good graces of the church and consumed by greed, essentially succumbing to the temptress known as money, he began to weave various tales for profit. However, the best was yet to come. When he teamed up with Dr. Carl Hacks to write a two-volume piece published in 1892 and 1894, telling the insider tale of one Diana Vaughn, in the words of Dr. Batali. The lurid details of her account boggle the mind. She was a member of the Palladium Rite, under the command of Albert Pike, where she was involved in ritual orgies and blood sacrifices. They would summon demons in physical form, and she was even betrothed to one of them. The thing is, is that it was just a fable created by Taxel. Diana and Dr. Batali never even existed. It was a work of fiction in his mind. And during his confession, he even said that the ludicrous public enabled him by being so gullible. The shock of Taxel's confession, the entirety of which was published in the Parisian newspaper La Frondeur, on April 25th, 1897, rocked the world. There's actually numerous archives of media at the time covering this story. It's a pretty interesting read. Regardless, I do have a few questions, because as we've all heard, oftentimes the best lies have a little bit of truth to them. The fact of the matter is that Albert Pike did hold occult beliefs, which were excised through the Freemasons. Albert Pike described the primary themes of morals and dogma as the secrets and the great mysteries, and it consisted of the symbols and rituals of the Freemasons. But we're going to get into that soon. I just want to point out that much is made of these occult theories, and it's tough to separate fact from fiction. However, I do have to say that we all know for a fact that people in power take part in very strange practices. So, on that note, let's start with some lesser examples. Oddly enough, really, I guess it's not so odd, but Hillary Clinton apparently really did join a witch coven. And I quote, Most famously, former Clinton employee Larry Nichols described numerous times in which Hillary would practice witchcraft with a California-based coven. And then the next week, she would go to church as if nothing happened. There's also some talk about communing with the dead. And I quote again, Yes, that's right, before the emails, the Russian collusion hoax, various stories on corruption, or Benghazi, Hillary Clinton dealt with a much less controversial stain on her character, which was reportedly that she liked to talk to high-profile dead people. In the 1996 book, The Choice, How Bill Clinton Won, author Bob Woodward, no stranger to a good scandal, wrote that the former first lady communicated with Eleanor Roosevelt and Mahatma Gandhi during her husband's term. Though, not Jesus, as that would have been according to Woodward's retelling, quote-unquote, too personal. Yeah, I'm sure that's the reason she didn't try to contact Jesus. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Jokes aside, from communing with the dead to palmistry, spiritualism has attracted many first ladies. While it is possible some ladies were better at concealing their practices, five in particular, Jane Pierce, Mary Todd Lincoln, Edith Wilson, Florence Harding, and Nancy Reagan, held moderate to strong interest in the occult. And that's according to Pat Kreider, the executive director of the National First Ladies Library. However, this rabbit hole gets way darker the deeper you look. So, do you guys remember that time hundreds of the world's most powerful people were caught worshipping an owl god deep in the woods, partaking in ceremonies, and even concluding their little get-together with a mock human sacrifice? Yeah, Bohemian Grove. Remember when they said they were just goofing off and it's nothing to worry about, and then, you know, everyone just moved on. Yeah, I remember that. You see the funeral pyre burning uh, with the effigy of a human. Or it could be real, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, there's been a lot of strange going on. We shall read the sign. Midsummer sets us free. You shall burn me once again. We also have the spirit cooking stories of recent years with Marina Abramovich, John Podesta, and the Clinton Obama group. I believe that art of the future is art without objects. This is just purely transmission of energy. The stories about Epstein's temple and the things that happened on that island. created a fake human being called Jeffrey Epstein, who is a mysterious currency trading financier with crazy rules so that no one would ever invest with him. He had a lipstick camera pointed at me from an art object that he 
laid a table that was preposterously long and thin with a tablecloth made of an American flag to make it look like a coffin so that I would spill my coffee on the flag of my own country. I mean, the fact that he looked like a mutant Ralph Lauren with this kind of labricious quality and he's talking all of the science and market stuff and nothing adds up. I mean, it's like one of these crazy scenes where nothing about it was normal. There was just no, there was no trace of a normal world. Over in the UK, you could go into Jimmy Seville and the royal family, and that one is a dark, dark rabbit hole. And personally, I'd even like to toss in the ceremony at CERN too. But I could go on, there's a lot of examples. Even the creation of NASA is mired in these stories because of Jack Parsons. Jack Parsons was one of the most influential figures in the history of the American space program. He was also a Marxist, stood accused of espionage, and held a deep fascination with the occult. Now, keep in mind, his interest in the supernatural went far beyond vaudeville magicians and astrology. By 1939, Parsons and his wife, Helen Parsons Smith, had fully embraced the teachings of the Ordo Templi Orientis, a central hub of Aleister Crowley's spiritual and religious philosophy, Thelema. <laughs> now, he also claimed to conjure spirits with Ron L. Hubbard, you know, the Scientology guy, and there's a strange tale of them trying to manifest Babylon. There's also claims that they actually accomplished this, and things even got too weird for Aleister Crowley himself, which is certainly saying something. And Parsons' scientific legacy is impossible to ignore. He forced the United States government to explore a science that it previously mocked, and laid the foundation for the rockets that carried man into outer space. He was one of America's greatest space pioneers. He just happened to also be one of its greatest occultists. It's very hard to find as weird and tragic a tale in the annals of science as that of Mr. Parsons. Born 100 years ago, Parsons seemed devoted to reconciling opposites, smashing together the technical and the spiritual, the white lab coat and the black robe, fact and fiction, science and magic. When he died in a mysterious explosion at his home, the tabloids were not the only ones to label him a mad scientist. So did the scientific establishment. The story of Jack Parsons was metaphorically locked in the attic, hidden in the footnotes and swept under the launch pad of the US space program. In one headline after his death on June 17, 1952, the paper read, slain scientist priest in black magic cult. However, we could also get into the strange practices done by Silicon Valley elites with their pursuit of immortality, or perhaps their obsession with creating their own god via artificial intelligence. So yeah, history is full of figures such as these, and the occult or secret knowledge is a common denominator. Even the foundation of the United States is mired by this, with deep ties to Freemasonry, symbolism built into the architecture, and as I have yet to state, secret societies even play a pretty big role, such as the Skull and Bones, which again is deeply tied into occult practices and disturbing rituals. However, one such group that is really held up as the de facto example is the Illuminati. Now, okay, when you break things down, it's really not as crazy as you might think. A group of rich intellectuals getting together for a circle jerk, talking about how much better they are than the mere peasants, finding out truths that are not available to the common man, a sort of club for drinking and exploring strange knowledge. It's really not far-fetched at all. Plus, the Illuminati literally means the enlightened ones. So yeah, they had a bit of an ego. The argument, I suppose, comes down to how much conviction they held with these beliefs and how far would they go to grab onto power. Well, it seems to be quite a bit, because it's widely rumored that after the Illuminati was banned by various governments, they essentially just merged with the Freemasons, perhaps a story for a different day. But the Illuminati did in fact exist. So make of it what you will. Anyway, with all that said, let's talk about Albert Pike and the Three World Wars. What's really interesting to me is the fact that even the debunking of it raises some interesting questions. Let me know what you think, because topics like this are really hard to nail down fact from fiction. Albert Pike is probably one of the most colorful Masonic figures in the 19th century, and one of the most controversial. From his first use of Lucifer, the light bearer, in Morals and Dogma, to being accused of forming the KKK after the American Civil War. Albert Pike was born in Boston in 1809, and he later moved to Arkansas where he joined the US Army. He served as captain and fought in the Mexican-American War. Politically active, he actually voted against secession, and wanted to take a more compromising view. However, when the first shots were fired, he joined the Confederate States Army and quickly became a Brigadier General. At the conclusion of the American Civil War, he was imprisoned and later released when Andrew Johnson became President. Johnson was also a Freemason. So yeah, they look out for their own, that's for sure. During his lifetime, he was an avid Mason and prolific writer. 
Albert Pike became the Grand Sovereign Commander of the Scottish Rite's Southern Jurisdiction in 1869 and served until his death. He is also credited with spreading Scottish Rite Freemasonry across North America. Albert Pike died in Washington, D.C. in 1891. Pike is the only Confederate to have a statue in the Capitol to this day. Well, actually, the statue was torn down during the riots of 2020. So, there's that. One of the most controversial theories about Albert Pike surrounds a letter he supposedly wrote to Giuseppe Mazzini, the Italian revolutionary, on August 15, 1871. Giuseppe Mazzini was a founding member of the Mafia and widely considered to be in the Illuminati. The letter, apparently, was held in the British Museum Library, according to William Guy Carr, a former British intelligence agent. This guy, William Carr, wrote a book in 1925, based on a different book by Cardinal Caro E. Rodriguez of Santiago, Chile entitled The Mystery of Freemasonry Unveiled, which was also written in 1925. So, according to William Carr and Cardinal Caro, the letter was a description of a vision that Albert Pike had, and it showed how the three world wars had been planned for many generations. Again, this was supposedly written in 1871, and I quote, The First World War must be brought about in order to permit the Illuminati to overthrow the power of the Tsars in Russia, and of making that country a fortress of atheistic communism. The divergences caused by the agents of the Illuminati between the British and Germanic empires will be used to foment this war. At the end of the war, communism will be built, and used to destroy the other governments, and to weaken religion. So, did he get that one right? Well, students of history will recognize that the political alliances of England on one side and Germany on the other, forged between 1871 and 1898 by Otto von Bismarck, were instrumental in bringing about the First World War. So, pretty good, pretty good. So let's move on to the second one. And I quote again, The Second World War must be fomented by taking advantage of the differences between the fascists and the political Zionists. This war must be brought about so that Nazism is destroyed and that the political Zionism will be strong enough to institute a sovereign state of Israel in Palestine. During the Second World War, international communism must be strong enough in order to balance Christendom, which would then be restrained and held in check, until the time came when we would need it for the final social cataclysm." End of quote. So let's check and see how close he was on that one. After the Second World War, communism was in fact strong enough to begin taking over weaker governments. In 1945, at the Potsdam Conference between Truman, Churchill, and Stalin, a large portion of Europe was simply handed over to Russia. And on the other side of the world, the aftermath of the war with Japan helped to sweep the tide of communism into China. So, I guess he was pretty close on that one too. But let's get to the Third World War. And I quote, The Third World War must be fomented by taking advantage of the differences caused by the agents of the Illuminati between the political Zionists and the leaders of the Islamic world. This war must be conducted in such a way that Islam and political Zionism mutually destroy each other. Meanwhile, the other nations, once more divided on this issue, will be constrained to fight to the point of complete physical, moral, spiritual, and economic exhaustion. They go on to say, and I quote again, We shall unleash the nihilists and the atheists, and we shall provoke a formidable social cataclysm, in which all its horror will show clearly to the nations the effect of absolute atheism, the origin of savagery, and the most bloody turmoil. Then, everywhere, the citizens, obliged to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries, will exterminate those destroyers of civilization. And then the multitude of masses, disillusioned with Christianity, whose deistic spirits will, from that moment on, be without compass or direction, anxious for an ideal, but without knowing where to render its adoration, will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer, brought finally out into public view. This manifestation will result from the general reactionary movement, which will follow the destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. So, let's check and see how close he was on that one. And so, to a lot of people, the use of the word Illuminati is highly suspect. The Illuminati, or the Bavarian Illuminati, as it is also known, was the brainchild of Adam Weishaupt, who himself was a Freemason, 
Well, it was formed in 1776, and it took many of its precepts from Freemasonry. At its zenith, the organization had as many as 2,500 members. But by 1790, it had conflicts with the Prussian Rosicrucians. And by 1800, this group was banned by many European countries, and eventually closed its doors during the anti-Masonic sediment of the 1820s and the 1830s. So, I suppose most people dismiss this because they assume that in 1871, when Pike's letter was purportedly written, well, they assume that the Illuminati did not exist anymore. Or perhaps the Illuminati just receded into the shadows. Just because they were banned and officially disbanded, didn't mean they really disbanded. And of course, many people just assume that they merged with the Freemasons, as Adam Weishaupt was a Freemason. So, again, I have no idea. It sounds to me like this group was receiving some heat and just went underground. And on top of that, it does make their little club a little bit more exclusive, doesn't it? I would imagine that was a huge marketing success for them. After all, getting banned by governments just adds to your underground street cred, no doubt, right? However, that's neither here nor there. Another inconsistency is the use of the word Zionism and Nazism. The use of the word Zionism did not take place until after Pike's death, and Nazism was not used until the 1920s. Also, Muslims were often referred to as Mohammedans, and the term Islam was not in the common vernacular. So there's a few questions we have to ask. Let's just assume that Albert Pike did not write this letter, and it was just conceived of by those two other guys in 1925, the ones who were investigating Freemasonry. Well, if that's the case, how could both William Carr and Cardinal Caro see into the future? In 1925, there was no indication that the State of Israel would be formed after World War II, or that there would even be a World War II. It's going to be another 20 years before that unfolded. So, how did they know? How did they know that communism would be a major player, when it was only in existence in Argarian circles in 1925? How did they know in 1925 that Nazism would later come to power in Germany? And finally, how did they know that Islam would rise to its current levels? Who knows? To me, it's just something interesting to think about. And let me know what you think too. All I know is that more than likely, the end of the world is going to come from the hands of humans, either out of greed, bloodlust, a quest for power, or perhaps as some misguided attempt to fulfill religious prophecy. Do I believe any of this? Again, I have no idea. I am far more worried about crazy people doing crazy things, rather than this true fate. In my humble opinion, our end is not written, and it does not have to go this way. Once again, this is Helio Wave. If you like the content, like, comment, and subscribe. Share the video if you want to. If you're in a position to, consider subscribing on Locals or Subscribestar. As always, make sure you disobey those true fascistas, and yes, I do hope you have a good night.